Hi, this is Tony Agnesi, and welcome to this edition of The Storytellers. This is episode 12 of our third season of The Storytellers. It debuts on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. on the Fiat Ministry Network and then is uh, played later that evening on the Patchwork Heart Ministry Network and on my YouTube page at Tony Agnesi. The radio program is produced for its third year now on the Living Bread Radio Network and airs on the Living Bread Radio Network stations. Each week on the program, we feature an inspirational guest and discuss not only their personal faith journeys and the ministries they share as authors, as speakers, bloggers, and radio and television hosts. And today we have not only a fascinating topic, but a fascinating speaker as well. Uh, Jim Bertrand is a um, certified presenter of the American Conference Eternity of the Holy Shroud. And we're going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin. He has done literally uh, hundreds of talks in 17 or 18 different uh, dioceses on the Shroud of Turin. And for those people who find that subject, as I do, fascinating, uh, you're going to enjoy this half hour. Jim, welcome to the program. It's great to have you on the Storytellers. Well, good day to you too, Tony, and thank you for that, uh, that kind introduction. You know, for those people, and I'm sure we have a few people who are unfamiliar with the Shroud, give us a little background uh, to kind of set the uh, stage, if you will, for our discussion today. Sure. What we're talking about is a Jewish burial cloth. And uh, the Jews have been burying their dead the same way for thousands of years. Uh, they place them in a, in a single cloth, sometimes linen, usually linen, sometimes sometimes a cotton, or sometimes even other material. But uh, it's... Uh, placed uh, lengthwise so that the one end is at the feet, the other end is wrapped around the head. And then they're lower, they're, they put a single strip usually and, and wrap it, they see a 15 foot long piece of, uh, of cloth to tie it off at the neck, a couple times around the body and tie it at the feet so that the linen stays on the body. And the Shroud of Turin is uh, the dimensions that would fit such, a, such an item and it leaves, it has an image uh, of a crucified man on it. It's, it's eight cubits by two cubits, which is exactly uh, 14 feet, three inches by three feet, seven inches. And the, there's a very, very faint superficial image uh, which we can't explain of, of a man who's been crucified and scourged with a lance wound and uh, blood stains around the head from a cap of thorns. And the tradition has passed it down through the centuries that this was the burial cloth of Christ, that this this was indeed the cloth what John and Peter saw when they when they looked into the tomb on Easter morning and saw and believed. So they did, the thing we're talking about is called the, the Shroud of Turin. It didn't come to Turin until 1578. Uh, before that time, it was known as the, the image not made by hands or the sacred burial syndone of Christ. So uh, that gives an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah, a lot of people might wonder, and I'm, I'm sure the question comes up often. You probably have had it asked a number of times. Okay, well then, how did it get from the from the burial spot of Jesus? What kind of a journey did it have to go through to finally end up in that 14th century in the town of Turin, Italy? Sure. Well, that's a fascinating question, and that uh, where do you where has it gone over the centuries? From about the year 1355 till the present, its, it's presence is very well documented. In 1355, it was something in Lyre, France, which played for some 40,000 people. And uh, later on, it was transferred to the House of Savoy in 1453. And that, that dynasty began in the 10th century, and lasted to the 20th century. Uh, and then later, it, it crossed from France into Italy in 1578 and restored the, the Turin Cathedral, the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And that's where it has been ever since. Now, before that time, if, you, if we just pick it up on Easter morning, Okay, Peter and John looked in and saw and believed. Um, we don't have a, a, a nice accurate record of, gee, where was it day by day for the next, you know, 13 centuries or so, but that that's, makes sense because it, you wouldn't expect it to be well advertised. If it's if its whereabouts had been advertised, it certainly would have been confiscated and destroyed. But we do have reference to a document that St. Jerome saw. St. Jerome translated the Bible into the Latin Vulgate fourth century, he held in his hand a parchment that explained how uh, 
Peter brought with him, the high priest brought with him the sacred burial linen of our Lord to Antioch. We know from the Acts of the Apostles, there was a persecution in Jerusalem in 44 AD. And uh, the, the apostles spread out. Peter went to Antioch. It's believed he took it with him and that it stayed there for about uh, five centuries. And then in 540, uh, there were, Antioch was attacked. By the way, Antioch is a very important city. Uh, that's where St. Luke was from. He wrote the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel of Luke, a very important Christian community. And uh, in 540, there was attacked by the Persians. And shortly after that, it appears in central Turkey, in a place called Anatolia, uh, the city called Kamaliana. And in 570, and by about this time is when we get the first uh, picture that seems to match up very well the shroud. If you think of icons, you think Russian icons and, and, and icons from the Catholic Church, most people would recognize that picture. I, I, uh, I'm sure you a small one here for our YouTube audience. So it looks like, okay, that. There we go. <laughs> people on the radio, you're just going to have to imagine that. Sorry about that. Uh, and th this picture matches up with over 150 points of congruence uh, from the shroud. The only difference is in this picture, the eyes are open on the shroud, the eyes are closed. Well, in 574, the emperor of Constantinople had the shroud brought uh, to Constantinople, and it stayed there until the year 1204, the Fourth Crusades. Now, there's another theory that said that it passed from Jerusalem to Odessa, and that was very commonly read about in the news. Uh, it was proposed by Ian Wilson back in the 1970s, but in, in light of more recent scholarship from Dr. Jack Marquardt, uh, it, it seems to be leading more toward Antioch than Odessa, but that's an open question. There are, there are five or six areas of the trout that are open on that. Well, basically, long story short, in 1204 was the sack of Constantinople, and that is where the trout disappears for 150 years. It's called the missing years until it turns up in Mary France in 1255. So in, in Shroud International Conferences today, uh, when papers are presented, those are the two areas that are talked about. One is uh, its history, especially in missing years. And secondly, how was the image formed? Because it's such a mysterious image that we cannot duplicate. There's no paint or pigment on it. There's no stuff to make the image. It's just there somehow in a very superficial way. Yeah, that, uh, I, I, that uh, you're, you're walking right into my next question, you know, and, you, is how, how could this be formed? You know, is it sweat? Is it, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing there that would, that would cause this image uh, that, that is discernible from just looking at it. What are some of the theories uh, that have have been uh, uh, laid out over the course of the years? Well, there have been uh, 10 that have been published in scientific literature over the last century. We could divide those into three categories. The first category was, could this be a natural process? Like if the body just lays in the clock, will this just happen naturally? And uh, those have been ruled out because of some problems. Like you mentioned, the sweaty face. If it was simply sweat going from the face onto the cloth, remember the face, the body's three dimensional and you would have a wraparound distortion because from ear to ear, it's about a foot and that face would be a foot wide and it was just wrapped. So the image was not formed by direct contact with the sweat. So we know it's not a natural process. And there's been some experiments that verify that. The second category, there have been two theories regarding, or excuse me, six theories about artist theories, was it? Was it a, a hot statue they placed this on? But again, you got the wraparound distortion problem. Was it a painting? Did someone invent photography you know, back in the 13th century and not cash in on it until you know we discovered it in the 1800s? Uh, all of those uh, art, artist theories um, have failed to account for some of the characteristics of the shroud. I'll give you a couple here. There are, there are 17 traits about the shroud that we know of, and any type of image formation process has to account for all of those. Uh, one of them is that there's no side images. And so, gee, how, you know, how could that be? Uh, another one is it is so superficial. When, when one is close to the trout, say within four or five feet of the actual trout, you cannot see the image, all right? The reason you see it in replicas is because replicas are made on four-foot printers with dye, and the dye soaks all the way through the thread, and so you're seeing threads that are soaked. Now, the shroud will, will show uh, uh, blood stains and water stains, and those stains that have soaked all the way through the thread. But the image itself is on the very uppermost portion. To give you an idea how, this, how small this is. If you think of right now on your shirt, there's probably a button. And if you look at one of those threads, that's how fine the shroud is. 
It's one third of a millimeter thick, okay? Tinier than a paper clip, it's extremely fine. And that one thread is made up of anywhere from 70 to 120 microfibers. Now under the microscope, if we look for the, the image bearing threads, we find that this yellowing effect only penetrates about two tenths of one micron. And to give you an idea of that, uh, there are a thousand microns in a millimeter. In a millimeter. A millimeter is about the size of a paper clip. Imagine yeah. 1,000 of that thickness, right? And then two tenths of that, it's, it's, it's called superficiality. And this is simply that one of the traits that all of the, uh, all of the artist theories have failed to account for, uh, as well as many other traits that they can't account for as well. Uh, another one, uh, the other third category is what we would call a radiation event. Call that the resurrection, if you will. Was there some type of radiant event in which energy burst from the body and somehow put this image on there superficially, whether it was photons of light or electrons from a, from a realm of discharge or uh, photons uh, in a type of, uh, or neutrons, excuse me, neutrons from a neutron flux. Uh, the most popular of these theories, that the one that explains all 17 traits, in fact, the only theory that can explain all 17 traits in the child is what is called the fall through hypothesis proposed by Dr. John Jackson in 1989. And it does satisfy all of those main traits on the shroud. Basically, imagine if there was a burst of light coming from the body at, and in one instant, this huge surge of energy, you know, uh, 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 and the body simultaneously becomes mechanically transparent and the cloth would collapse through the body Pulling out of the sides as it goes. Imagine where the nose is in contact with the cloth. Okay, coming down from the top down, it, it, it pulls out and it collapses through this body in the plane of gravity. And this would account for what we see on the shroud of a, 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 a face with no side images and no distortions, no wraparound distortions. And there's something else that's very peculiar in that in those points of the body that are most in, in uh, intimate contact with the cloth, they show a darker yellowing. And the parts that are further away, say for example, the eyes, mm -hmm. they're a couple millimeters away from the cloth at the instant of uh, image formation, they're darker. And there is a direct proportional correlation between the cloth to the body distance at the, at the, at the moment of image formation. So when you see a picture of the shroud in a photographic negative, you see much more of the details, but there's a, there's a direct correlation there. And it even shows that uh, one of the cheeks was swollen. Um, I don't know if, if for your, your Zoom, for your people watching on YouTube, on the two cheeks there, one of those cheeks has been examined by the uh, forensic pathologist from Los Angeles County. And the, the cheek is swollen because it's lighter in color on the photographic negative. It's darker on the shroud. And so that cheek indicates that it was tighter up against the cloth because it was swollen. And, and so the face is asymmetric. And interestingly, the face on the pantocrator icon, that icon made in 558 E, is also asymmetrical, showing that. And there's a portion of the beard that is missing, all right? And if you think of, I say, a 50, he said, I gave my back to those who beat me. You see the scourge marks. My, my cheeks to those who pulled my beard, part of the beard is missing. My face, I did not shield from puppets. Those, those elements of Isaiah chapter 50 are physically manifest on the shroud. The other question, uh, and, and I know uh, when you hear about the shroud in, in modern times here, uh, it generally surrounds some question of carbon dating and, and trying to pinpoint, uh, Jim, the, you know, you know, is this old enough to go back to Christ and so forth? I know there were some people that thought maybe it might be, you know, uh, old, but not that old. Like, tell us a little bit about the carbon dating sure. uh, research that's been done on the shroud here in modern times. Right. Well, well, carbon dating has been used for a few decades now, and it's, it's been used in the scientific world because you basically look at the ratio between carbon 12 to carbon 14, and that gives you an idea of the age. Uh, one of so it's still used today. However, there is a problem with contamination. Other contaminants, if other carbon gets into it, and that throws off that ratio of carbon-12 to 14, and more carbon-14 makes it look younger than it actually is. And this happens in about 20% of 
of carbon dating tests, uh, one out of every five is thrown out. And so contamination is, is a very real problem. Well, in the 1988 test, there were uh, three laboratories that were given sample from the shroud, one in Tucson, Arizona, one from Oxford, England, and one from Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, Michael Tite of the Oxford uh, Laboratory, he was in charge of, actually he was in charge of the British Museum of Natural History. Uh, he was in charge of overseeing the test. Uh, there were 15 protocols that had been agreed on in the months and years before this test. Uh, and all 15 were violated in that test. They were supposed to take samples from three different sites on the shroud. And instead it came from just one site in the lower right-hand corner by the right foot, which was where it was normally held, which was by, held by people to display. It was later to determine that the most contaminated, worst possible location could have been chosen. And that was the only, the only site that was chosen. And it's marking because of the handling, not because of a fire or anything like that. And those samples were all about the size of your thumbnail. And those were published in 1989. Uh, I won't go through the 15 protocols that were violated, but, but there was the information leaked out. There was data sharing between the labs that were supposed to be confidential, that they were talking about this kind of thing. Anyway, when that came out in 1989, it, it indicated that carbon dating, uh, say, uh, about 1325, plus or minus 65 years. And so that made headlines, of course, throughout of folks and so forth. Well, right away, uh, we started with uh, some other scientists started looking at some of the data that was published in Na Nature magazine, published this, and they found there were some errors, some significant errors, in such that every inch, every inch of the cloth gets a century younger as you go from the outside of the cloth to the inside of the cloth. And at that rate, it'll be thousands of years in the future. So it was suspect and challenged from the very beginning, but it could never be proven because the labs not publish their raw data. They didn't publish what the machines actually said. Well, there's something called the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a it's an international law, and a European by the name of Christian Casabianca was able to invoke that law, and the courts opened up, forced the, the labs to share their data. And indeed, uh, when, the, when the true data was shown in 2019, the the discrepancy between the, the, this plot that was supposed to be adjacent to me because all these little pieces were so heterogeneous and disparate that they did what's called a chi-squared test on it. What are the chances of that happening? Uh, almost infinitesimal. It's called significant deviation. There's acceptable deviation. You can be off a little bit. And then there's significant deviation. And this showed significant deviation. So the, the test was always suspect, uh, but it was, it was proven to be invalid in 2019. So in the scientific world, Carbon dating test of 1988 is no longer an issue. But my guess is among the general population, there are people that probably think it's still an undecided 50 50 thing. Yeah. It's simply not the case. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about what makes the shroud so relevant today and why are so many people inviting you to, to speak? What, what, what is the attraction in 2020 of the shroud of Turin? Sure. Well, you know, many people have, have had a difficult year of living in isolation, living in fear. And when we get so distracted by, you know, the moment to moment things that we're going through, we lose track of the big picture. You know, where am I going? Well, I'm going towards eternity. You know, we're going to step into eternity. And what the shroud does is it provides this very real cloth with a real image of who we believe to be Christ. And by the way, he was five feet, 10 inches, about 170 pounds. It makes Christ very real. I, I gave this to a seminary once. And seminarians came up, and of course, all of them believe in the real presence, of course. But but to see the man on the shroud, and it was, it was real blood, and, and it was, uh, all of those things that go along with that, it just reinforces for them you know, the, the re resurrection of Christ. And this image, we believe, um, you know, the tomb was empty. Why? We believe that Christ rose from the dead. So the shroud is a sign of hope. And when we see the image on the shroud, and we consider the reality of the resurrection, because you see, our faith rests on the reality of the resurrection, and not on the authenticity of the shroud, okay? But the fact that the two may you know, both uh, complement each other should be all the more reason to give us hope that, sure, we may be going through tough times now, but, but in the end, there's this, we're going to step into eternity, and uh, hopefully be an eternity united with God, so there's a great sign of hope. 
Jim Bertrand is my guest. Jim, um, what, what's fascinating to me, uh, tell us a little bit about your background um, preparing you to to do the work you do with uh, with uh, speaking and touring with the Shra, uh, the uh, subject of the Shra. But how is um, how has it affected your own personal faith journey with, with all the knowledge you've gained on the Shroud? Has that had a personal effect on your faith journey? Sure. Yeah, you got a few questions there, the, the background and then the effect on me. I, I would say that the majesty of this space and the fact that uh, after studying it for some 30 years, uh, seeing that uh, a natural process is ruled out, so it just doesn't happen on its own, it's an organ. And secondly, all of the artist theories that fail to account for all of these unique characteristics. There's 3D information on the trout as well. Like I can't, I've got time to go all through 17 traits. So if you rule out an artist's drawing, if you rule out a natural process, you know, what's left? What's left is a supernatural event of the resurrection, perhaps caused by a burst of light, a rising Christ. And if you think about that, we all are familiar with. I talked about the mechanic of the transparent body. If there was a burst of light coming from the body and it collapses through this mechanic of the transparent body, think how Jesus appeared to the apostles on Easter night. They're locked in the upper room, right? And he comes among them. How could that be? Well, if he had a resurrected body, it was a transparent body no longer subject to the laws of nature. And so the door presented no obstacles. So then, okay, so we accept on faith that he appeared to the apostles on Easter night. Then the question becomes, when did that moment begin that his body acquired this, this unique uh, ability? Well, if it occurred at the instant of the resurrection, then this would account for a vertically aligned 3D image with no side images for the entire body. Entire, from head to foot, there's no side images in a very, very superficial way. To give you an idea of how much energy we're talking about, uh, several physicists have written on this in published papers. It would require every laser on Earth uh, to be concentrated on this cloth for 40 nanoseconds, which is 40 billionths of one second. So it's an instant that is just so minute that we, we can't imagine someone trying to pull that off. And so all of that light and all of that brief period of time would somehow perhaps dehydrate the fibers and cause them to yellow to leave this image at 2 tenths of So the effect on me is that, uh, you know, I, I believe in the resurrection with or without the shroud. But with the shroud, I think you know, maybe God has given it to us for a reason to, to strengthen our faith and certainly give us a reason for hope. Uh, my background, Tony, I, I've been teaching high school science for 39 years. I, I taught biology for 32 years at the high school level, and I, I taught physics and chemistry the last seven years. So that's where I'm coming from on that. And uh, in 19, or back in 1981, when I first got interested in the Shroud, there was National Geographic magazine uh, presented this, this article on Dr. Jackson's research. In 1978, there were 33 scientists that he led, and they studied the Shroud for 120 consecutive hours uh, around the clock. There was always several scientists working on it. To this day, that remains the most comprehensive factual uh, study, survey we've ever done on the Shroud. And they were trying to answer the question, how was the image formed? After three years of publishing their data, they could not answer that question, but they did determine these three facts. Number one is that it is uh, it's not a painting. Uh, number two, there's no paint, there's no pigments or dyes, and it's not the work of an artist. And number three, there's no, there's no physical means that can account for the totality of this image. And so that, that kind of hooked me in terms of, wow, this was, how else can you explain this? This is a real thing. And so studying it for years, I in 1996, I invited Dr. John Jackson to come speak to my, my parish. And so he went to Colorado Springs to Lincoln, Nebraska, and he gave a presentation at St. Peter Parish. We became friends, we hosted him, and we stayed in touch over the years. And he has about more than four decades of research that's been combined into a book called The Shroud of Turin Critical Simmering. And this book was, uh, was basically assembled and edited by an engineer named uh, Robert Seeker, very good friend of mine, and they invited me to come to the Turin Shroud Conference in St. Louis, Missouri, an international conference in 2014. And at the end of seeing all of those 42 papers presented by scientists, they asked me, could you, could you take this book, it's, it's 134 pages, and could you put it into a PowerPoint that we can share with people? 
And I agreed to that. And I started working on that November of 2014, actually October of 2014. I've been doing it ever since. And I have to tell you, Tony, that the foundation of this is really prayer. Um, my first seven presentations were to religious communities. And as I shared this PowerPoint with them, uh, the nuns and sisters, I asked them to pray for me on Fridays. So they prayed for me on Fridays. And that's kind of the foundation that's lifted and opened door, lifted me up and opened doors in other venues, uh, high schools, universities, college settings. I've, I've given them in men's and women's prisons, uh, uh, lunch groups, uh, just mm -hmm. you name it, and all kinds of people. The Shroud appeals to everyone. It really does. We're, we're, we're almost out of time, and I wanted to give you an opportunity here before we run out of time. Of how I, 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 if somebody who is watching or listening wants to to make a uh, get you to make a presentation in their 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 state or their parish or for their organization, how do they get in touch with you? Sure. Well, I don't have a personal website, but I can give you my email, and that's usually the way it works. They send me an email, and they invite me out, and I come out and give the presentation. And I don't make a dime from this, Tony. I've been doing this for years. I, I don't make any money at all. Uh, ask people to cover my travel, you know, and I come some, sometimes stay in post homes. And then if they want to make a donation to the conference community, they may. But whatever amount they're comfortable with, we're comfortable with. That email address is bsaints2 at gmail.com. B E S A I N T S, number two, at gmail.com. And they can reach me there. Jim, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this has been a fascinating half hour, and uh, really, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, that's our show for today. My thanks to Jim Bertrand uh, and uh, the fascinating subject of the Shroud of Term for being with us today. The program premieres at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings at the Fiat Ministry Network, later at Patchwork Heart Ministries, and on my YouTube page at Tony Agnesi. The radio program is produced by the Living Bread Radio Network, and it airs Sunday at 4 p.m. on the Living Bread Radio Network stations. And at 4.30, it'll be on thestorytellersradio.com and later that week on the Catholic podcasting site, breadboxmedia.com. It's available where all your podcasts are. Or you can get it at Spotify and Google+, Plus, Apple, and so forth. That's our show for today. I'll see you again next week with another episode of The Storytellers. This is Tony Agnesi. God bless you.